You're listening to Forward Faster, bite-sized insights for entrepreneurs. Hi, and welcome to Forward Faster. I'm Sujatha Ramanujan. I am the Managing Director of Luminate, and I'm here today with Dr. Sana Gaspar, the CEO of Rubitection. And she's here today to tell you about the technology she's developed and the business she's developed that really focuses on skin health and skin care, specifically with chronic illnesses and, and serious issues. And we're very excited to have Dr. Gaspar. Thank you for the great introduction and the opportunity to be here today. So we're here and we're really excited to talk about these technologies, how they address the temporary, chronic, and potential fatal skin issues that are unfortunately quite common in our society. So with that, I'm going to ask you my first question, which is, what trends with skin conditions and issues did you see that, that are problems that you felt that really had to be addressed and solved? Um, so that's a great question. So the trends I would say that um, I noticed was first um, an increasing elderly population, um, which uh, puts people at risk for more chronic skin conditions, mm -hmm. um, that including bed sores as well as diabetic foot ulcers, um, as well as um, trends in the healthcare space around those wounds where there was a lot of either penalization for the facilities or an, a, a greater need for care management in the home because um, another trend in healthcare right now is a lot of the care is moving out of acute care setting like a hospital and moving into more of a home care setting. Um, I would say those are the three major trends um, that I saw in, that, in, in the conditions that made me want to pursue it. I think that the last major trend was that I noticed that a lot of the um, severe potential outcomes associated with those conditions, with diabetic foot ulcers or with bed sores, um, typically disproportionately affect people of color or more specifically African Americans more. Um, but with early detection, you can reduce the incidence of those severe, um, outcomes. And so that's our, our goal at a high level. So tell me a little bit about how your technology works when you're detecting a bed sore or a diabetic foot ulcer. That's another great question. So the way our system works, um, it's a handheld device that you put on the skin. Uh, while it's on the skin, it shines light into the skin, so it's an optical-based detection approach primarily. Um, we then measure the, the light that's reflected back and then process that to look for skin wet redness and blanching. Um, and then we also couple that with other complementary measurements of the skin like temperature and uh, firmness. Then we, we then further process that to either assess risk or to provide uh, some level of diagnosis. Okay, so who, who could use that? Is that something that's used by uh, nurses and doctors? Uh, so currently in the, in the manual uh, approach that's being done in hospitals and in home care right now, it's mainly done manually. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit of using our technology is that it provides a tool that anyone can use. It could be a caregiver like yourself, maybe caring for your mom at home, mm -hmm. or you could be a nurse, an LPN in a nursing home, or an, um, an acute ICU nurse and use the, the technology. So our goal is really to make it accessible. And we're also thinking long term that in terms of usability, in terms of ease of use, that it could even be used in a clinic, for example, in a developing country. Um, so we're really trying to keep that as one of our main design requirements as we develop the technology, that it's easy to use by anybody. So... Tell me a little bit, let's talk about bed sores for a second. Uh, for those of us who are, are not acquainted with you know, how catastrophic they can be and how people detect for them right now, can you walk me through a little bit about how bed sore detection is done now and what are some of the pitfalls and problems that happen in our current system without your system in it? Yeah, so the current uh, method is a manual test called the Blanche test. Uh, so the way they do that test is they'll look for on bony areas of your body, look for area of redness. And then they'll come over and they'll push on it with their finger and look for it to go white and come back red. Um, if that response is observed, it means your skin is healthy. If they push on it and it stays red, um, that means you are developing an early stage bed sore. So as you can imagine with this test, anybody can really do it. Um, so it's easy, it's cheap, it's low cost, but it's highly subjective. Um, and as the person's skin gets darker, you can't see that response at all until the skin has broken open. Um, the result of that is that... Um, 
when a diagnosis is made, you're not sure if it's correct until a couple days later if the skin opens up. Mm -hmm. um, you're also not able to monitor incremental changes. So you don't know if the treatment you're doing is working, if it's effective, or if the skin is still breaking down. Um, it also leads to um, a lot of those conditions being missed on admission for, into the facility when um, hospitals are doing that full care assessment and they're trying to determine what care is needed for that patient for, to provide personalized care. Um, they oftentimes miss it on admission and then end up having to be penalized for it. Um, the, the ultimate outcome of that is that the person develops a severe bed sore and it can become infected and then they die. But if you can catch it early with an objective, reliable test, you can prevent that. Okay, so from like the patient and the care end, you're preventing a lot of pain, agony, and potentially preventing a death. Mm -hmm. And from the administrative end, tell me a little bit about how much financial incentive there is for hospitals and others to adopt this bed sore detection. Yeah, so that's a another great question. So there's a lot, right now there's a lot of financial um, incentive for them to adopt the technology. Um, in the past, this was a condition that was paid by um the government in terms from an insurance standpoint. Um, once they did their, you know, public health analysis and realized how expensive it was, which could be as high as $11 billion per year, um, they decided that that was too expensive for the government to continue paying and they stopped paying the cost for that and shifted that to the facilities. So the average cost um, calculated by the government for an, a bed sore could be as high as $45,000. Per bed sore, you can have a patient that has more than one bed sore on their body at a time. Um, because of the lack of insurance payment, company, hospitals are now responsible for that cost. Mm -hmm. They are also um, putting at risk up to 1% of their annual Medicare revenue. Um, and there's also a, another third financial incentive where they can, if they can lower their numbers um, and show that they have good quality measures, they can get some money back. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a financial penalty, but they're putting at risk also a financial bonus. So there's a lot of incentive to um, put policies in place and technology in place to drop the numbers down as low as possible and keep them there. So when we look at this technology, say, in a nursing home, because you have a lot of elderly, do they get the same incentive? Um, More or less, yes. Yeah. So like if they if the bed sore develops in the facility, they are responsible for that cost of care. Um, and so the incentive for the nursing home is that um, if they can prove that the patient came in with it, even if the patient's being transferred to a hospital, the insurance company will cover that cost. Or at least, actually, it won't cover that cost, but it will not penalize them on their quality measures. And quality measures is what's used to, um, as a financial incentive at the end of the year, and also used to rank them um, in terms of quality as patients look for the best nursing home, let's say, to put their family in. So I'm going to switch horses a little bit here and ask you about some of the other th technology, and it's not actually some of the other illnesses and uh, conditions that your technology can be used to detect or assist with the treatment of? Yeah. So um, we're actually really excited about that opportunity to also broaden out to other skin health conditions. Mm -hmm. So some of the top, uh, let's say, two or three other conditions we think the technology could be used for outside of bed sores and diabetic foot ulcers would be um, in a dermatitis space. So we're looking at rosacea, dermatitis, possibly eczema as well. Um, not so much in detecting them, but in monitoring uh, treatment effectiveness okay. so that you can support patients in the home with customized care and also with treatment adherence and compliance. Because oftentimes, um, if you can imagine if you have a rash, you're always looking at it to see if it's getting better, if it's getting worse. Um, and when the doctor gives you medicine, it sometimes takes a week for you to actually see the effects of the medicine and people sometimes will stop using that. Um, we also want to um, use a technology for those applications to use them predictively mm -hmm. that um, for patients who potentially have their dermatitis or eczema in the control, they can have flare-ups. Um, and it's hard to predict those flare-ups currently. So we're, we want to see if we can help it from that perspective as well. Um, and then the other potential application would be more in, um, in plastic surgery, um, where we would help with either potentially help with burn patients or amputations in terms of monitoring the skin health afterwards and healing and adherence. Okay, so I didn't know about that one. I'm, I'm wondering about now uh, uh, 
about people who have other surgeries. So like I look at like breast reconstruction and things like that. That usually has a skin graft associated with that. Is yeah. that another place yes. where that's used? Yeah, that could be another application for the technology. Okay. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit earlier about diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, do you see that as a potential growth area? Or? Very much so. It's very similar to a bed sore. It's diagnosed in the exact same way. Um, it, the main significant difference is um, at a high level is that bed sores are more acute. Mm -hmm. So they can happen over a day or two, you know, as someone who's really frail, where diabetic foot ulcers may take, may happen over a longer period of time. So maybe a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, Similarities where our technology really becomes helpful is that if you can catch both of those early, you can start putting in preventative measures. Um, and so it's it's a very valid market. Oh, I was just thinking this is a personal antidote. So I know my father was um, in his 80s. He he because he's my dad, he decided he had to visit us in Rochester. He lived in Michigan at the time, and he drove much against all of our. Best advice to hop a flight, and we no, nope, you drove. <laughs> okay, and you know it's a, it's a solid seven and a half hour drive. It's not a short drive from from southeastern Michigan here. Okay, and when he got here, his feet were bothering him. And you know he's he's diabetic, so mm. we proceeded to have a semi freak out where I wanted someone to look at his foot immediately, immediately, immediately. Which uh, we we're very fortunate that. Um, uh, we have a friend who is an elder care physician, and he, she quickly agreed to take a look at it that day. But I was wondering, you know, in a case like that, if if you know that you have diabetes, you know that you're elder, if you had this unit, I'm wondering if there was like a way to use, take the scan. I don't think that a, an amateur can read your scan necessarily, but take the scan and have it sent to the physician or the doctor as opposed to the iPhone shot of his foot that I sent the doctor. Yeah. Um, is yeah. that... The vision for how it would be used is very similar for how we think it would be used for diabetic foot ulcers. Mm -hmm. Where you'd put it on the skin, we would give you, take the measurement, give you an assessment of risk. Mm -hmm. um, and it could potentially also be used diagnostically. And then that information can also be sent to the doctor for telehealth. Okay. Um, but our goal is really to be uh, kind of close the loop on the circle of care. So like for the situation with your dad, if you had our technology, you'd put it on, it would tell you what his skin risk was or give mm -hmm. you a diagnosis um, and also then give you care plan recommendations. And then you can still send that to the doctor and potentially have a telehealth meeting with them. Okay. Um, Cause that sounds really useful. And I also think um, when we talk about, as you said, these type of skin conditions are harder to detect in people of color. Yeah. Um, we don't, turn colors exactly the same way. No. <laughs> and also, diabetes is a problem that is very prevalent in the, in the black population, the southeast Minority Indians, communities. Yeah. yeah. And South Indians and uh, Asians have a very high prevalence of diabetes. So it's yeah. uh, really a huge problem in Basically our community. Basically all minorities, S South Americans, African Americans, Southeast Asians, it's... We have a prevalence of diabetes, and, and yeah. we are harder to detect these foot ulcers and other issues on. So I'm actually yeah. very excited about <laughs> your technology coming out in these areas. Uh, so I, I want to ask you a question. Let's go back to the technology because we just walked into some of the areas that are more consumer-oriented. And there's a lot of, like, phone apps and photo apps that say, oh, you're on the edge of a sunburn. Um, mm -hmm. That's quite different in, in image acquisition analysis than what you do. So you want to make a comment about the core of the technology that you use and why it's so much uh, more indicative of problems than, say, a picture on my iPhone? Yeah. So I would say the picture on your iPhone, and there's a lot of applications of image processing in dermatology. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that you can have problems as you transfer that. For example, if you're sending that to a doctor, depending on what kind of device he's looking at it on, that image looks different. Um, and then... Yeah, depending on how it's processed, you can't always pull everything out just on image processing. In comparison, our device is actually taking a measurement of your skin, like directly on your skin. It's not an image of your skin. We're taking a, a measure, a measure of the temperature, the stiffness, um, redness, which says, which gives information about the vascular health underneath your skin. So it's a more, um, direct measurement. While I would say a lot of the image proce processing is secondary, and there's, in my opinion, there's a lot of room for error and miscommunication when you're sharing those pictures because not all of the devices in terms of their optical resolution and uh, color um, resolution as well as the same. 
And I'm also wondering, just because you, know, you are using reflectance spectroscopy. So reflectance spectroscopy tells you, you know, this is the particular wavelengths you're looking at. This is, this is an absolute wavelength measurement. Yeah. Um, whereas well, I think image processing is a, is a database saying, you know, if I see these colors, I think it's this. Yeah. And I'm wondering also, is there, is, more, is there more depth? Is there more skin? I don't know enough about your technology to answer that. Um, there is a potential opportunity to get depth. Right now, we're not pulling that information okay. out, but yeah. That's fine. Um, so I'm going to ask some other questions now. So this Luminate's in its uh, third cohort now. And, uh, you know, we've been trying to hone our, our what we teach, what we bring. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what is it that you think uh, you got out of this accelerator? Was it was it worth it? Uh, yeah. So I would say if I had to do it again, which is usually my benchmark for if it was good or not, mm-hmm. <laughs> if I would have to do it again, I would say yes. Um, the major thing that I got out of it um, was, I would say, shifting um, the thought more towards um, planning out the sales process. So, like, I always knew how we would sell it, but how to put that in a strategic plan of, like, hiring, like, the whole process. Um, I would also say the benefit of the program which I think um, was important, especially during COVID, was that you're in a... So, like, during COVID, a lot of the startup infrastructure at a high level was collapsing. So investors were pulling back, companies were going out of business, um, people were in lockdown. Um, And the Luminate program basically went remote, but you still had the team of people there to be supportive. And in addition to that, the pr- the program then gave additional funding during that time period where people were thinking, I mean, the program got extended, so we got additional funding, but it, it basically at a high level comes out to the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was also um, beneficial to be in an accelerator type program during the whole COVID process where everybody was freaking out, but you still had like a core team of people who were like, we still want to see you successful. What the- you know, we're going to support you. What basically? What does everybody need right now? Is everyone like okay? <laughs> well, it would be a bad accelerator that just jettisoned teams while you are in the accelerator. So it was our goal yeah. to make sure that everybody uh, got the support and care that they needed. And that's what I'm asking for. Did we did we respond well to that, or was that? Did you feel abandoned? No, no. I think you got to respond well to that. I think the the first. Uh, real impact was making it virtual. So like, you know, even if people are in lockdown somewhere, they can still access the programming. I think that was super beneficial. And in, in my opinion, I think it made the program more efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, then the second part was um, just being able to leverage the network from Luminate in general. So, you know, um, introductions to different people who could help you. Because, I mean, even during COVID when people are just like, you know, heads down, my house is on fire, people are still willing to take an introduction from someone they know, Mm -hmm. right? As opposed to if you were like cold calling and cold emailing people during COVID, that's a little harder. That's a little harder. Um, so I would say those would be the major benefits. And the other third major benefit was, I think, getting educated on the um, new trends in marketing. Because um, I think prior, because I was pre-market, I was I was unclear about exactly how I could leverage marketing now to grow the company because I can't technically sell anything right now. Mm -hmm. So I didn't spend a lot of time on marketing before. I mean, I had a website, et cetera, but in terms of executing the marketing plan to um, grow the company in my mind, I was like, Oh, that's a later stage step. But in the program um, in terms of learning the process, I learned that that could be done at any stage and it's just, you switch the focus. So even at my stage now I should be doing it and the focus should be awareness yeah. And as I grow, you just shift the focus. But so that was that was actually really, really good to know because it will also help me solve a few problems that I'm having now, which is a lack of awareness, right? And I was, you know, but prior to the program, I was like, I'm not sure how I'm going to solve that because normally, traditionally in the healthcare space, awareness is 
achieved through publications, conference presentations, or your products on the market and you are marketing it that way. Um, so pre all of those things, I was like, I'm not sure how I'm going to get people to know about the business per se. Like they may hear about it at a competition or in a news press, which was traditionally how it happened. But outside of that, I don't have a way of getting people's attention. Um, and then through Luminate, I learned like, no, you could still just use traditional, not traditional, but modern uh, marketing techniques, you know, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, with the goal of just bringing awareness and then, you know, doing the lead generation. So that was, that was, I think that will, I'll really be helpful. I haven't implemented that yet, but I'm in the process. It's, it's, <laughs> so always, it takes a, time. it's always an ongoing process in yeah. a regulated medical environment. You cannot sell something that does not have yet approval. Right. So tell me something completely different now. Um, what is the hardest part about running a startup? <sighs> Lord have mercy, Sujatha. <laughs> <laughs> I've had three. I understand. There are moments there. What kind of trick devil question is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Where where do we start? I mean, pull up my list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the hardest uh, part I would say would be, well, I would say from my perspective, because I was coming out of the university um, and I hadn't worked before, in a, let's say in a corporation. Um, so I would say the hardest part would be raising money because Coming out of the university, I didn't have the network because, you know, I, when you're in a, in a grad program, you're not thinking about going to networking events and building your network with investors and things like that. So I would say it was not having the network and um, what people perceived as the experience mm -hmm. to do it. Um, granted, I think that's a bias because there's a lot of startups, uh, entrepreneurs who don't have experience. Um and access to people with capital, I would say that would that is the biggest hurdle. And for me, I think that was the biggest hurdle, uh, partly because doing hardware, you can't really make progress without money. It's like very you have, tough. You have to pay engineers. You have to pay to make the, make it, fabricate it. Um, it's not something you can just build in your basement with a hundred thousand dollars and and say you're bootstrapping. So, what advice do you have for founders of other startups? At what stage or from what context? You're, it's, it's, it's your show. <laughs> okay. So what other advice I would have? I would give three pieces of advice. One is to connect with un other entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, because it's just uh, too hard to do something like that by yourself. And that's a constant roller coaster. And you need people who are going to understand. The everyday person, if they have an experience that does just doesn't understand. Their main advice is, well, just get a new job or get a job. You're just like, that doesn't solve the problem. This is, <laughs> that is not helpful. Um, so I would say other entrepreneurs, for a few reasons, they will understand, they might be before you or like earlier than you or later than you. And so either way, they can give you their advice on what they're going through or help give you connections. Um, and they also share resources. At a high level. So I think like other entrepreneurs are your best resource. Um, then my th second piece of advice would be to entrepreneurs always be building your network because the unfortunate truth, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And that becomes really true as you're in a startup because it's all about faith-based gambling, a.k.a. investing. And so if people, if people don't know you, they, they don't know people who know you, it's really hard to get them to give you their money. Like you need, you know, and that's especially true if you're a minority because people are like, I've not seen someone like you in here doing tech. What is, what is this? Right? So you, without the network of somebody to um, make an introduction, a warm introduction, or for them to have been in an environment where you were featured somewhere that someone can say, oh, okay, you know, I, I can vouch for this. It's very hard to get the support you need to grow. Um, and then I would say my third piece of advice would be to do competitions. 
<laughs> I know you don't like them, but if people are paying, if people are really, um, if people first can get in and then take it as a learning experience, not just that you're there to win, there's a lot you can pull out of it. There's connections to potential corporate sponsors who are usually sponsoring those events. There's direct connections to investors who, let's say if you're missing that network, they've now seen you pitch on stage. They've seen you go through, let's say, the uh, application process, and they are now a little bit more receptive to talking to you um, if you don't have that network. So Sana, tell me something. Right now, what help, what assistance does Rubitection need to get to the next step? Another great question, Sujatha. So um, right now we are um, at a point where we're trying to grow the company. So we're looking for team members uh, to grow. That's both technical mm -hmm. on, and on the business side and marketing. Um, we're also looking for funding to support uh, testing and technology development. Um, and we're also looking to develop uh, clinical partnerships and corporate partnerships. Um, so I would say if anyone, you know, are looking to work in a, fast-paced startup environment that's still centered around teamwork um, and also, you know, get in on a great investment opportunity, let's say, early, mm -hmm. which is the best time to get in, everyone. Best time is early. <laughs> as well as uh, can facilitate any clinical introductions or corporate introductions. Um, that's where we would really need some assistance right now. And they can just email us at info at rubitection.com. Let's fast forward 10 years. Okay. What do you think the ten in skincare and monitoring? What do you think it's going to look like? Um, the field itself. Yeah, I think in ten years there's going to be more technology to have objective assessment. A lot of um, the approach in skincare now is very subjective, even with the images. I think and um, technologies that capture images. I think that's still pretty subjective right now. So I think um, because there's been a lack of technology, there hasn't been a lot of um, objective measurements and then all of the risk tracking that you can do once you have objective measurements um, and care personalization that you can then put in place with that data. So I'm thinking, I'm hoping and thinking over the next 10 years that um, we'll see more technology that facilitates personalized care in, in, on the skin care space. Okay. Um, and now tell me, what's 10 years from now? What's ahead for Rubitection? Where do you see yourself? So in 10 years, we would be a bigger company. We we'll hope to be not just national, but potentially international. Um, and then also possibly broadening into uh, the dermatology space, so uh, other aspects of skin care and health. Yeah. I have this vision for you, and you can rearticulate it. I, I would like to see not just that you're on the national, but you're kind of the standard that you, when you walk into a hospital that would be of, with certain types of admission, be it elder care or something, the, you'll be rubitectioned. <laughs> yes, you'll be rubitect. <laughs> you, you'll be rubitected <laughs> as you walk in. <laughs> or you'd be ROST. Have you used the ROST on Sujatha today? Yeah. So that's the abbreviation, Rubitect Assessment System. Uh -huh. So RAS. So have you been ROST? Did you Ross her? <laughs> that exactly. sounds really weird, though. <laughs> you want it to be so common. Like that, Google. <laughs> or Xeroxed or whatever that yes. you want that. That is my ultimate goal. Yes. And not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, yes. Because you can imagine also predominantly around the world, most people are brown. Mm -hmm. And we're, they're having like skin assessments just difficult on brown people. You know, it's not necessarily a, a racial thing per se. It's just bio, It's just a biological artifact of having brown skin that it's harder to see changes on the on on your skin. So I I would say I from from your lips to God's ears <laughs> that we become the standard, not just in the U.S. but around the world. That that would that would be that would be my ultimate vision. That would be wonderful. Okay, well, Sana, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you join us here, um, and for being, thank you for being part of Illuminate. So if you want to learn more about Rubitection, I urge you to go to their website, rubitection.com. That's R-U-B-I-T-E-C-T-I-O-N. Dot com yes. and learn about the Rubitection system. If you want to follow Forward Faster series, please go to nextcore.org. And that's N-E-X-T-C-O-R-P-S dot org slash 
podcast and see this podcast and uh, many, many more. Uh, we look forward or join us on Spotify or iTunes and search for Next Core Forward Faster. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.